Where's, where's my Where's my Where's my Where's my Where's my Where's my Where's All right, the Rules Committee will come to order. Um, America's history with the indigenous people that are native to this land um, is atrocious. Uh, there is no other way to put it. Uh, it's appalling. Thankfully, it's becoming common to acknowledge this publicly, whether that means recognizing Native American Heritage Month every November or pointing out uh, that this capital is built on the sto stolen land of the uh, Nakach Tank and Piscataway people who lived uh, along the Potomac River long before this country existed. But the truth is that simply acknowledging this truth is not enough. Uh, words alone don't absolve us of the horrific injustices brought on Native American communities at the hands of the U.S. government. Actions do. And that is why I'm hopeful that today's historic hearing opens a new door towards building greater understanding and the possible inclusion of these communities in Congress. You know, in 1835, the U.S. government and individuals from the Cherokee Nation negotiated a treaty of new uh, Echota, uh, Echo uh, an agreement with this government that was ratified by the United States Senate. The treaty, which led to the forced removal of the Cherokee from their homelands, included a provision that says that the Cherokee Nation, I quote, shall be entitled to a delegate in the House of Representatives of the United States whenever Congress shall make provision for the same." End quote. It's been nearly 200 years. Uh, but I'm proud that this committee on this day at this hearing for the first time ever is exploring procedural options for the potential implementation of seating a Cherokee Nation delegate. This is a complicated issue, which is why we have experts with us today to help answer questions and help us to find a way to move forward. And several other tribes have also come forward to say that they're entitled to a delegate as well. So while the conversations we're having pertain solely to the Cherokee Nation, we know that more work will have to be done to examine this issue further. Look, at, I personally believe we need to find a way to honor our treaty obligations with the Cherokee Nation, even though it will be a potentially challenging road uh, to get there. But we need to honor those treaty obligations. And Congress should find a way to make this happen. Uh, and now let me turn to our ranking member, Mr. Cole, a member of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma and one of only a few Native Americans serving in Congress right now uh, for his remarks. I'm proud to serve alongside of him every day, uh, but especially today as he helps this institution navigate this important issue. Probably some days more than others, Mr. <laughs> Chairman, but uh, this is a good day. And uh, I want to thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank my friend Chief Hoskins for being here. Uh, we're here today for an original jurisdiction hearing examining the legal and procedural factors related to seating a delegate from the Cherokee Nation in the House of Representatives. Before I continue my remarks, I want to personally thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing today. I'm hopeful that the discussions that we have today help lay the groundwork for other committees of jurisdiction to examine this issue in more detail. Regardless, today marks an important first step toward examining the questions and the process surrounding the seating of a delegate from the Cherokee Nation. As a member of the Chickasaw Nation and co-chair of the Congressional Native American Caucus, I've always voiced my support for the federal government to honor its treaty obligations. Far too often, uh, excuse me, for far too long uh, in our nation's history, the federal government accumulated a sorry record of making promises to tribes and then breaking those promises as soon as it was expedient to do so. Only in recent years has the record improved. With today's hearing, we begin examination of a specific promise made in the Treaty of New Echota in 1835, and I certainly welcome the examination of this question by Congress. Uh, but it seems clear from the language of the treaty that this right is not self-executing and would require action by Congress to implement. As we consider this, members of the House have real questions about this issue, and the purpose of today's hearing is to begin examining those questions in detail. In addition to basic procedural questions, these questions will include, are there other tribes that have this right? 
why did the tribe choose to select its delegate by council vote rather than by vote of the tribe? Are there concerns about double representation resulting in constituents have, being represented both by their geographic member of Congress and by a delegate from the tribe? Is this arrangement constitutional? And if so, what factors must be considered? How would the seating of a delegate change the character of the House if, in, if it did at all? <coughs> Many more. I list out these questions for our witnesses to discuss, along with others that will assuredly come up during today's hearing. It's important to note that the right uh, contained in the treaty may be clear, but the resolution of those rights and how they uh, may be applied still require great examination and consideration. If the House ultimately decides to move forward, it will only do so after a bipartisan recognition of the claim and a bipartisan process going forward. We should remember that the Cherokee Nation is not the only tribe that has or may have this right, and the process we ultimately follow for this claim may apply to others as well. I'm glad to see tribes advocating for their treaties with such conviction, and today's hearing represents a starting point in that bipartisan process of recognizing tribal treaty rights. However, additional work and consideration is needed, uh, particularly by the other committees of jurisdiction. And I hope the work begun here today continues to carry the process forward, ideally examining all such claims by tribes that possess them. Finally, I wish to clean up a common misunderstanding about the nature of today's hearing uh, that I've seen reported in the media. This is a hearing to give Congress an opportunity to understand the issue of seating a delegate to represent the Cherokee Nation. There's no vote on that issue today. Indeed, at present, no legislation has been introduced on this issue. Today's hearing is a good first step, but we have a long way to go in the process. Indeed, until legislation is proposed and the issues taken up by the, uh, all committees of original jurisdiction, Congress is unlikely to act. I thank our witnesses for appearing before us today in what I think of as an historic hearing, uh, and I look forward to their testimony. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, and I thank the ranking member for his opening statement, uh, and I now want to introduce our distinguished witnesses. Um, Chuck Hoskin, Jr. serves as the principal chief of the Cherokee Nation. Prior to being elected to his role in 2019, Chief Hoskin was Cherokee Nation's Secretary of State and also served as a member of the Council of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, Lindsay Robertson is a professor at the University of Oklahoma College of Law uh, and, an indigenous law and, and, and an Indigenous Law Center visiting professor. He teaches classes in federal Indian law, constitutional law, and international and comparative Indigenous peoples law, among other topics. Uh, Manion um, A. Schwartz uh, is a legislative attorney uh, in the American Law Division of the Congressional Research Service. Uh, in that capacity, Ms. Schwartz provides nonpartisan legal and constitutional analysis to Congress on a range of matters, including federal Indian law and congressional authority over the United States territories. We are delighted that all three of you are here. Uh, and uh, Chief Hoskin, we will begin with you. And just make sure your, yeah, your light is on. Yeah, good. Certainly. Chairman, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and distinguished members of the committee, OCO. That's hello. I bring you greetings from the Cherokee Nation Reservation. Before I go into my remarks, I want to acknowledge that representatives of our government, other than myself, are here today. We have our Speaker of the Council of the Cherokee Nation, Mike Shambaugh, is here. Uh, Councilman Keith Austin is here. Councilor Joe Deere is here. A member of my cabinet, the Marshal of the Cherokee Nation, Shannon Buell, is here. And of course, our delegate to the United States House of Representatives, Kim Teehee, is here with us. We're honored that you're all here. This is, Mr. Chairman, an historic day for the Cherokee Nation and an historic day for the United States. We're re-examining something that is of critical importance to both the United States and the Cherokee Nation, and I thank you for holding the hearing. I speak to you today on behalf of not only the more than 440,000 citizens of the Cherokee Nation, but millions of Cherokee citizens who have waited for this day to come since 1835. This morning, we'll examine a promise made to the Cherokee Nation in the Treaty of New Echota, 1835. That, Mr. Chairman, is our removal treaty. This was the agreement that directly led to the deaths of thousands of Cherokees on the Trail of Tears. 
In this treaty, the Cherokee Nation conveyed the entirety of our lands east of the Mississippi, about 7 million acres, to the United States. In exchange, the government of the United States made certain promises. One of those promises was that it is, quote, stipulated that the Cherokee Nation shall be entitled to a delegate in the House of Representatives of the United States whenever Congress shall make provision for the same. That's Article 7 of the Treaty of New Echota. The carefully constructed promise found in that article was in fact critical to secure the agreement of the Cherokee people. Quote, the Indians will never approve that bill without the delegate. That was from a negotiator from the Cherokees, John Ridge. Quote, if you fail to obtain for us the right of being heard on the floor of Congress by our delegate, let the bill perish here. The bill did not perish. The federal government agreed to the delegate. The parties entered into the Treaty of New Echota, and the Senate of the United States ratified that treaty. Our right to a delegate was brought forward in our last treaty with the United States in 1866, and it remains the supreme law of the land. Cherokee Nation and Cherokee Nation alone is the tribe that is the party to the Treaty of New Echota and the Treaty of 1866. Cherokee Nation has, in fact, adhered to our obligations under these treaties. I'm here to ask the United States to do the same. It's time for this body to honor this promise and seat our delegate in the House of Representatives. No barrier, constitutional or otherwise, prevents this. As you consider this issue, I believe it's important that you remember the following. First, the Treaty of New Echota is a living, valid treaty, and the delegate provision is intact. Lapse of time cannot abrogate a treaty. That is settled law. To abrogate a treaty, Congress must do so expressly and clearly, and it is not done so here. Article 7 uses classic mandatory language that creates a right for the Cherokee Nation and imposes a duty on the United States. The provision twice uses the word shall. It uses terms stipulated and entitled. This right is unique to the Cherokee Nation. Seating our delegate would not open up the floodgates to other tribes seeking their own representation. Only three tribal treaties contemplate some voice in the House of Representatives. Of these, the Cherokee Nation right in the Treaty of New Echota is by far the clearest and most direct. Fairness, as always, Mr. Chairman, is important, but denying Cherokee Nation our right to a delegate simply because this is not a universal right shared by all tribes is not fairness. Our ancestors prioritized this right in the negotiation of the Treaty of New Echota. We have no right to claim the treaty of other tribes. They have no right to claim ours. Concerns over dual representation have been voiced and they are not warranted. It's well settled since the founding era that the term representative in the constitutional sense requires that the representative have a vote on the House floor for final passage. A delegate in this body has no such right. Indian treaties, unlike international treaties, are self-executing. And the Congressional Research Service ask whether this treaty right is self-executing, but CRS points to cases addressing international treaties, and there is, Mr. Chairman, a distinction. Now, I acknowledge the Supreme Court has repeatedly concluded that an international treaty must be domesticated through a federal statute. However, Indian treaties are inherently domesticated. All of the cases that have considered this have held that Indian treaties are self-executing. And Mr. Chairman, I would point the committee to the 1986 Supreme Court case of Sosi versus the United States. The court summed it up this way, quote, the government has simply failed to counter the argument that no case has ever held an Indian treaty to be non-self-executing. 
Mr. Chairman, the House has ample authority to unilaterally seat a treaty-backed Cherokee Nation delegate. Under the Constitution's Supremacy Clause, treaties and statutes create the supreme law. Since a treaty established the delegate position, there's no need for a separate statute to create the delegate position. This would render the treaty right in Article 7 of our treaty meaningless. We agree with the CRS that the House could seat our delegate by adjusting its standing rules through a House resolution. Mr. Chairman, tribes, tribal organizations, and tribal citizens across the country strongly support our effort. They understand that fulfilling this promise would be an historic victory for treaty rights and sovereignty. The Treaty of New Echota requires, requires, Mr. Chairman, the House to seat our delegate. I urge you to seat Kim Teehee without delay. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I am a proud American and I am a proud citizen of the Cherokee Nation. I have great respect for the United States House of Representatives. Because of all of this, it is my firm belief and expectation that the House of Representatives will take swift action to seat our delegate to Congress, honor our treaty right, and therefore make the United States good on its promise to our Cherokee ancestors. Wado, Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Chief, uh, for your powerful testimony. I now would like to turn to Professor Robertson. Uh, you're recognized for your testimony. Good morning, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, uh, and other distinguished members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Robertson, and uh, as the chairman mentioned, I'm a professor at the University of Oklahoma College of Law and currently visiting senior scholar at the and uh, indigenous law visiting professor at the UC Hastings College of the Law. I've been a professor of federal Indian law for more than 30 years and taught constitutional law for more than 25. From 2000 to 2010, I served as special counsel in Indian affairs for Oklahoma governors Frank Keating and Brad Henry. It's an honor to have been invited to address this committee on this important topic. My role today is to provide an overview of federal Indian law for those committee members for whom the field is not familiar terrain. Tribal governments in the United States are both pre-constitutional and extra-constitutional. That is, they existed before European settlement and they operate apart from and not directly subject to the Constitution. The power that tribal governments exercise is inherent, not delegated by the United States. Federal Indian law deals in large measure with sorting out which sovereign, federal, state, or tribal, has jurisdiction over activities that occur within tribal lands, which the US code calls Indian country. The United States recognizes more than 500 tribal nations, all of which the US Supreme Court has characterized as domestic dependent nations. Nations, and not simply aggregations of individuals sharing a particular heritage, but domestic nations, not foreign nations, and therefore having a special relationship with the United States. In the same decision in which it recognized the tribes as domestic dependent nations, Cherokee Nation versus Georgia in 1831, the court described that relationship as being like that of, quote, a ward to his guardian, close quote. In 1886, in Kagama versus United States, the court recognized a substantive legal consequence to this relationship. As guardian or trustee, the United States has power to legislate over Indian affairs, but also the responsibility to exercise that power to the ultimate benefit of the tribes. During most of the 19th century, following the British colonial model, the United States engaged with tribal governments by treaty. These treaties often provided for cession of tribal lands, but they covered many other areas as well, military and political alliance, trade relations, and criminal jurisdiction, for example. In one instance, the Treaty of New Echota of 1835, they provided for the sending of a delegate to the U.S. House of Representatives. 
As the federal courts long ago understood, during virtually all of the period of U.S. tribal treaty making, severe inequalities existed in the relative bargaining power of tribes and the United States. Treaties were universally prepared in final form in English, employing American legal concepts often unfamiliar to tribal signatories. Commonly, the U.S. Army was an active presence during negotiations, resulting in intimidation. To reflect this reality, courts interpreting treaties with tribes have employed canons of construction similar to those used in interpreting adhesion contracts. Ambiguities are interpreted in the tribe's favor, treaties are liberally construed in favor of the tribes, and treaty provisions are interpreted as the tribes would have understood them. Other treaty construction rules arise from the United States' role as guardian for the tribes. Because the United States is guardian, for example, congressional abrogation of treaty rights requires clear evidence of intent to abrogate. All tribes, of course, have different treaty rights, their nature and scope based on individual circumstances. And although I suppose it's a theoretical possibility, to the best of my knowledge, there has never been an equal protection claim brought by one tribe against another based on a treaty right. Similarly, although it's clear that in international relations, treaties may be either self-executing or non-self-executing, I know of no historical instance of an Indian treaty being held to require implementing legislation prior to the vesting of rights. I thank you for holding this hearing and for allowing me the opportunity to appear. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now I want to recognize Ms. Schwartz for, for your testimony. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and distinguished members of the House Committee on Rules. I am, as you mentioned, the legislative attorney in the American Law Division of the Congressional Research Service, and I'm here to discuss the legal and procedural factors related to seating a Cherokee Nation delegate in the House of Representatives. <coughs> I'm honored to be here. The issue of seating a Cherokee delegate in the House rose to prominence a few years ago when my co-panelist today, Cherokee Nation Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin, Jr., announced his tribe's intention to nominate a delegate to represent the Cherokee Nation. This announcement invoked a provision of the 1835 treaty between the Eastern Cherokee Tribe of Georgia and the United States government. That's the Treaty of New Echota. For the purposes of this hearing, I am proceeding on the understanding that the Cherokee Nation is a modern day successor in interest to the Eastern Cherokee Tribe of Georgia. CRS does not take a position on whether any other tribes may make similar claims under the Treaty of New Echota. As you are aware, CRS is a nonpartisan agency serving all parties in both houses of Congress. We do not take a position on whether Congress should or should not attempt to seat a Cherokee delegate. Our role is to offer legal and procedural analysis, enabling Congress and this committee to understand the options available to it along with any attendant risks or uncertainties. In this specific situation, because Congress has never previously given effect to the Cherokee delegate provision of the Treaty of New Echota, nor ever seated a delegate from a tribal nation in the House of Representatives, there are both legal and procedural uncertainties. It is possible, though not certain, that any action to effectuate the Cherokee delegate provision could prompt constitutional challenges whether on equal protection or other grounds. Whether courts would entertain such challenges depends on factors such as who brings those challenges, what legal principles they invoke, and what harms they allege. The likelihood of potential challenges may also depend on what action, if any, Congress chooses to take. Congress has never seated a delegate in the House other than by legislation going through bicameralism and presentment. A chart in my written testimony details the long history of seating territorial delegates in this manner. However, Congress has also never before seated a delegate in circumstances like those here, where a treaty provision ratified by the President with the advice and consent of the Senate contemplates that delegate. There is an argument that in this context, seating a Cherokee delegate requires only amendment or change to the House standing rules. 
that approach, which would rely primarily on the House's constitutional authority to, quote, determine the rules of its proceedings, close quote, would be novel and a break from the House's prior position with respect to seating territorial delegates. Still, that approach does not appear to be exclu explicitly prohibited by constitutional or statutory text, so long as the delegate is a non-voting participant along the lines of the current territorial delegates. However, such an approach would also re require reaffirmance every two years, it would not establish a permanent position. There may also be counter arguments to that approach, including that the Treaty of New Echota itself says the Cherokee will be entitled to a delegate in the House whenever Congress, rather than one chamber, shall make provision for the same. Ultimately, Congress may be empowered to apply elements of its views on this and other matters of interpretation. Although US courts often have final authority to interpret treaties' meanings and requirements, Congress plays a unique role in treaty interpretation when it implements treaties domestically. The canons of treaty interpretation applicable to Indian treaties, as discussed in my written testimony and by my co-panelists, although generally viewed as guidelines for judicial interpretation and not binding on Congress, may inform Congress's interpretation. I look forward to answering the committee's questions. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you all for your, for your testimony. And, um, and I, now we'll, we'll, go to, we'll go to questions. Um, I should tell you that since we announced this hearing, um, uh, you know, I've heard uh, a number of uh, concerns about appointing a Cherokee Nation dele delegate from uh, colleagues in the House, and um, as well as uh, you know other tribes, uh, other groups. And um, but I, uh, but I'm very sympathetic, uh, Chief, with, with with the way Chief Hoskin out outlined this. I mean, I, I really, I think there's a strong case here, um, and that doesn't mean that we don't consider the other uh, issues that other tribes have raised on its merits, um, and we, we, ought, we ought to do that. But, uh, but nonetheless, but I, 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 I want to raise some of the questions that people have asked, um, you know, not to be adversarial, but to get the answers on the record, um, because um, I support this effort. Um, and um, so um, you know, we can, I think we can use um, these answers to kind of figure out how best we can move forward and how we can um, address some of the concerns that people have raised. Um, and so let me, let me go through a few questions here. So uh, Chief uh, Hoskin, uh, the Cherokee Nation Constitution calls for the delegate to be appointed, not elected. Um, you yeah, this is in this chamber here, uh, the People's House, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure there's precedent in modern times for the House to seat and appoint a delegate with equal status to someone elected by all the voters in in Washington, D.C., or Puerto Rico, for example. Uh, so what's the reason for an appointment rather than an election? And would the delegates uh, constituent, and, and what would the delegates' constituency be? Uh, and do you view it as absolutely necessary that the delegate be appointed? Well, the Cherokee people determined that the, yeah. that the delegate should be appointed. And this is where the United States could show deference to the Cherokee Nation as a sovereign Indian nation. The Constitution of the Cherokee Nation prescribes the manner in which the delegate is, a, is, is selected it's through an appointment by the principal chief, confirmation by the council. In this instance, I appointed Kim Kehe August of 2019, unanimously concerned by the, confirmed by the council, our, our legislative branch. So in, in, in the first response is deference to the Cherokee Nation's uh, sovereign act of determining how uh, the delegate is selected. The terms of the treaty itself say that the Cherokee Nation shall have a delegate. It doesn't prescribe the manner in which it's selected. I suppose the framers could have done that. I suppose the United States is probably the uh, party that had the pin on this treaty, and they didn't choose to prescribe how uh, the, tr the uh, delegate was selected. Thirdly, I would say, if you look back in history to the early days of this republic, uh, in fact, territorial delegates were appointed. We have some uh, specific citations we can bring to the committee's attention, but that is, in fact, in the historic record as part of the House of Representatives. Thank you. Uh, I, and you addressed this a little bit in your opening, but um, again, I want to get this on the record. Um, I want to address the, the super vote issue, uh, which is a frequent object, objection that I've heard as, uh, as Congress considers this matter. Uh, I'm sure the constitutionality piece will be covered further uh, in this hearing, so I, I specifically want to talk about representation on committees. 
uh, when the treaty was signed, Oklahoma wasn't a state, um, and its residents had no representation in Congress, and Native Americans uh, could not vote. Uh, obviously, now members of the Cherokee Nation do have congressional representation. Uh, delegates, delegates don't vote on legislation, as you pointed out, uh, on the House floor, but they do vote in committee, uh, as well as introducing bills and amendments. Uh, so the idea is that, for example, if a delegate from the Cherokee Nation gets a seat on the Ways and Means Committee uh, and a member from Oklahoma is already on the committee, many Oklahoma citizens would get two representatives on the Ways and Means Committee, uh, so the argument goes. So Chief Hoskin, how would you respond to people arguing that members of the Cherokee Nation would be doubly represented on committees? Well, the argument misses that the Cherokee Nation is the uh, sovereign nation whose interests are represented by the delegates. I mean, the treaty itself was a treaty between two sovereign nations, the United States and the Cherokee Nation, and the uh, parties uh, determined that the Cherokee Nation uh, governmental interest would be uniquely represented in the House of Representatives. So in that sense, I don't see the double representation. Pointing back to my earlier testimony, uh, the ultimate action of this body in terms of the representative action, in terms of me as a citizen of the 2nd District of Oklahoma, Congressman Mullen is my uh, congressman, uh, his action of voting on final passage is him taking my voice and the voice of uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of other Oklahomans to the House floor, uh, but not before then. Uh, before then, it is a matter of Congress's committee structure. And so in the case of Kim Teehee, a delegate, she would not vote on final passage. So in that respect, there would not be double representation for a single Oklahoma. Cherokee people are all over this country, 441,000 citizens, every state in this country. Uh, but uh, again, the governmental interests of the Cherokee Nation were what the parties contemplated uh, when they crafted the Treaty of 1835. Well, thank you very much for clearing that up, because this is helpful for us to be able to rebut people who you know, bring some of these arguments uh, forward. So I think it's important for the record. Um, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're very interested in process here at the Rules Committee, so I want to discuss the mechanics of, of seating a delegate. Uh, Ms. Schwartz, um, how were current delegates like those from Guam, Washington, D.C., or the Mariana Islands seated, and what did that uh, process look like, generally speaking? Thank you. Uh, every delegate, including the current territorial delegates, uh, have been seated through the operation of a statute that passed both houses of Congress and then was signed by the president. Um, so that is, you know, the, the list of those delegates and the attendant statutes um, are listed in my written testimony, and that's historically been the way that delegates were seated in the House. So, and that would require the House to vote, the Senate to vote, the president to sign the bill. Correct, or of course a overturn, uh, a, a, a vote by a supermajority to override a veto of the president. Yeah, yeah. It's just really hard dealing with the Senate. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm just. Right, right. Um, <laughs> Professor Ro Ro uh, Robertson, um, in your view, should a tribal delegate be seated through a statute versus a simple resolution, or would the treaty, or, or, or would the treaty impact that process? I think the treaty has to impact the process. I think that the treaty um, is is written in the way it is for a reason. Uh, you know, it, it might um, uh, have uh, provided for representation in um, in Congress that expressly seated the delegate in the House. I think with the contemplation that the House of Representatives would make the final call. The Senate had the opportunity to weigh in and did at the time of ratification. Uh, as I suggested earlier, and Chief Hoskin, I think made the same point, um, as, as had CRS, the, uh, the, the, the fact that it's an Indian treaty is important because we don't have Indian treaties that aren't self-executing. Um, and in fact, in this instance uh, as well, there was no hesitation on the part of the United States, even in the absence of further legislation, uh, in implementing federal rights under the Treaty of New Echota, which included the removal of the Cherokee people. Uh, so one side was happy acting as if there were no need for further implementing legislation. And I think what's happening now uh, is uh, that this body uh, is considering uh, whether it's time uh, for the United States 
to finish fulfilling the obligations that it made under this treaty. Um, I think it's also, so in a sense, I guess what I'm suggesting is simply deferring to the language of the treaty. The, the, the other deference that I think may be appropriate, and this relates a bit to your earlier question, Mr. Chairman, uh, is uh, deference to the Cherokee Nation, uh, both on the choice between uh, whether uh, Congress should pass a statute which would benefit them in the sense that was uh, alluded to earlier, uh, in that it would be of greater duration than two years, uh, or uh, through uh, unilateral House action, um, which would have to be renewed. And they've clearly, as I understand it, opted in favor of the latter course, despite uh, the, the potential termination of that right or the need to renew it. Um, they are the, the party that's going to be impacted uh, most directly. And so, so I think that deference may be, may be appropriate here, particularly given the long time it's taken to get around to uh, allowing them to exercise the right. Um, uh, but, but, I, but I also think uh, that it's important, uh, as, as I said earlier, that we don't have a history of requiring implementing legislation uh, and, and deference to the language of the provision. And, and Chief Huskin, do you have any concern with the prospect of the Cherokee delegate position being up for debate every two years um, if it were created through a resolution uh, versus a statute? Well, certainly if it was through a statute, you could make the argument that there's a durability to right. that. But in my view, the United States Senate has acted, the President of the United States has acted, it's incumbent upon the House to act. I acknowledge that that means a, a, a every two-year proposition of coming back to the House. My feeling is this, as Chief of the Cherokee Nation, if the United States at long last, after nearly two centuries, agrees to uh, honor this promise uh, in this Congress, and it could happen this year, uh, I, would, uh, I would think it'd be breathtaking for the next Congress to say we're going to then break this promise. Now, I'm a tribal leader. I know my history. I know the United States has broken a promise or two. In fact, it has broken every treaty it's ever had with the United States. But I think in the 21st century, when this House of Representatives seats Kim Teehee, there won't be another Congress that will dare break that promise to the Cherokee Nation. Thank you. Uh, so uh, the Rules Committee has received letters and statements from several other federally recognized tribes requesting that Congress consider seating their delegates as well. We received a statement from the uh, chief of the Choctaw Nation supporting the Cherokee Nation's request and requesting that a Choctaw Nation delegate also be seated on the basis of the 1830 Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. I ask unanimous consent to insert the statement in the record uh, without objection. We also received a letter from the President of the Delaware Nation requesting that if any tribal delegates are seated, uh, the House also seat a delegate from the Delaware Nation on the basis of the 1778 Treaty of Fort Pitt, or uh, the three successors of the historic Delaware Nation cannot agree on the delegate to seat a delegate from each tribe. Uh, I wish to, you know, uh, wish I ask you know, his consent to insert that letter in the record without objection. Uh, we also received a letter from the Assistant Chief of the United Kituwa Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma arguing that they are a successor to the historic Cherokee Nation. I ask unanimous consent to insert the letter in the record along with the resolution appointing a delegate without objection. And finally, we received a letter from the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians arguing that they are a successor to the historic Cherokee Nation. I ask unanimous, cons unanimous consent to insert the letter in the record without objection. Look, we're here today to discuss the Cherokee Nation's request to seat a delegate. But as we continue to work to honor our treaty obligations, I think it's important that Congress also look into these other requests. And so, Ms. Schwartz, I know the Cherokee Nation Treaty was the focus of your report, but has CRS looked into whether other tribes may have treaty-based claims for some form of congressional represent representation? And if not, is that something that CRS could do? Thank you. We have looked at the treaty provisions in the treaties that you've mentioned, um, the treaty with the Delawares of 1778. Uh, if it would be helpful, I'd like to read the way that that provision is sure. worded. Um, the agreement in that treaty was to form a state whereof the Delaware nation shall be the head and have a representation in Congress provided nothing contained in this article to be considered as conclusive until it meets with the approbation of Congress. So that treaty provision uh, first is 
slightly more um, dependent on congressional approval than the wording of the new Echota Treaty. And it also more expressly contemplates the creation of a state that, of course, was never created and that this body could not create on its own. Uh, the Treaty with the Choctaw, which is sometimes referred to as the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek of 1830, five years before the Treaty of New Echota. I'm going to quote from that as well. Uh, that tribe, uh, quote, expressed a solicitude that they might have the privilege of a delegate on the floor of the House of Representatives extended to them. The commissioners do not feel that they can, under a treaty stipulation, accede to the request, but at their desire, present it in the treaty that Congress may consider of and decide the application. Uh, end quote. So that treaty, in contrast to the Treaty of New Echota, um, did not include a stipulation for a delegate, but mentioned the desire of the tribe to have a delegate. Um, that does not mean that Congress could not take right. an action, um, but it does mean that the, the claim is somewhat weaker than the Treaty of New Echota provides. So, and let me just, just to put a final point on this. I mean, so the Treaty of New Echota is pretty clear um, about um, what, uh, what was agreed to and what our obligations are. I mean, uh, and, and I guess what I just want, I say that, and, and I just want to make sure that you agree with me on that. I say that, you agree with me on that, right? <laughs> I agree that the language of the okay, Treaty okay, of New yeah, Echota yeah, is the clearest yeah, of the treaties right. between yeah. the United States and various tribes. Yeah. And I, I say that because I, what, I, what I hope does not happen is that as we, you know, I mean, everybody, we need to look into everything, right? But me looking into everything doesn't mean that we have to wait, you know, uh, on taking action on something that to me is pretty clear. Um, as is as what we're talking about here today. So we want to, we, we respect all of the input that we have received from everybody and we need to, we need, we need to consider all of this stuff. However, um, I think the case that uh, the chief uh, is bringing before us today is pretty specific um, and pretty clear, at least the way I look at it. Um, uh, and so, uh, but I, I thank you for your, uh, I now yield to uh, Mr. Cole. Well, first, uh, let me begin where I started off. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. And I want to thank you and the witnesses for the demeanor of the hearing and the manner in which we're looking at issues, because the issues you raised in your questions, and I'll have some of my own to raise, are exactly what I hear from other members. It's really not a partisan issue. It becomes an institutional issue. And so this is extraordinarily helpful in discussing, uh, you know, the institutional uh, matters in front of us, and also, uh, you know, indirectly looking at the merits of the claim. And let me say, I, I agree with the chairman. Each one of these should consider separately. They're not linked together in any way. Each document we should look at, each decision we should make individually. And, and uh, the fact that others have a claim should not affect the claim that the Cherokee Nation is advancing. I, I very much agree with that. Chief Hoskins, um, I would like to ask you in a more practical way, actually, how do you view the role of the delegate to Congress? Would he or she, and in this case, I think we could say she, Kim is a very good friend of mine and somebody I respect greatly. How would, uh, would that member be treated in the same manner as other delegates that we currently have? Or, or would he or she have different duties, rights, and responsibilities than like the delegate from Puerto Rico and Guam and Samoa? Well, uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. I think they would be similarly situated to the delegates that uh, serve alongside you today. So the opportunity to serve on committee, have committee assignments, vote on committee, propose legislation, debate, uh, all the way to the House floor, of course, not voting on final passage. Otherwise, I think it's the entire depth and breadth of the delegates that serve in this body today. No, I think that's really important for other members to understand. We're not talking about anything different here than we already do in multiple cases. Uh, in this regard, in terms of how that delegate would act and, and the authority and responsibilities they would have as a member of Congress. Second, and I get this question a lot, so I want to pose it to you. Obviously, this is an old treaty right, 1835. Why was it not addressed or impressed immediately? And I would also take that on advisement. I mean, you know, I'm delighted to hear your answer, but if you have additional information later from historians or whomever, I mean, that's a question I get, well, gosh, if this was there and it was a treaty, why wasn't it done immediately at the time? Why didn't the 
Cherokee Nation, and maybe it did, advance the claim at the time? Congressman, I love this question because it gives me an opportunity to talk about Cherokee history, of which there's not enough knowledge in this country. That's you why I opened the door. You certainly <laughs> possess it, but uh, and I, I won't miss the opportunity. Uh, the history since 1835 with the Cherokee Nation has been one of rebuilding and then being suppressed again, being oppressed again, being dispossessed. We seem to be in rebuilding modes through the last two centuries. Think about what happened. The Trail of Tears uh, uh, came after the Treaty of New Echota nearly destroyed the Cherokee Nation, lost a quarter of our population, ripped apart our institutions, uh, was the near destruction of the Cherokee Nation. We rebuilt. That story, Mr. Chairman, ought to be an entire story that every American understands because our rebuilding is incredible. But it took a great deal of resources. So when we get to our new homeland and what would later become Oklahoma, we are simply trying to survive and rebuild a great society. Decades go by. The Civil War visits the Cherokee Nation and brings even more destruction and division than the Trail of Tears, if you can imagine that. We go into another period of rebuilding in the post-Civil War era, late in the 19th century. Uh, at the turn of the 20th century, as we know, the state of Oklahoma is created by the Congress of the United States. A number of federal Indian laws are passed, which again dispossess Cherokee people of our collective possessions, our lands. Nearly, disp nearly dispossesses us of our government. I think, uh, Congressman, a lot about my grandfather in this role. Let's get into the 20th century, my grandfather's century, a full-blood Cherokee World War II veteran. The United States suppressed the democracy of the Cherokee Nation to such a degree that he could not vote for a chief of the Cherokee Nation during most of his lifetime. I don't imagine he ever thought his grandson would be the elected chief of the Cherokee Nation. But in the 1970s, we start to rebuild, and we've been on a trajectory as has other tribes in Oklahoma and across this country, of building economic strength, prosperity back home. And so we are now, I think, in a position where we can, as a practical matter, assert this right, whereas my predecessors in the two centuries before, frankly, we were just trying to hang on to our way of life and rebuild. So that's the explanation. Well, just to offer a personal comment and support, I know exactly what you're talking about. My great-grandfather was treasurer of the Chickasaw Nation at that very same time. And he had to sit there in our capital on the second floor and figure out how to dispose of our property, uh, which was taken for, from us inappropriately, uh, you know, both in terms of individual plots and then, frankly, what we gave back to the United States government to try and protect, like the what's the heart of now the, the Chickasaw National Recreational Area. Uh, it was literally sacred springs to us, and it was, we didn't want them in private hands. So we literally gave it back to the federal government so it would be, and it's, in, it's now the core of a national park. But believe me, I, uh, uh, I understand the difficult decisions that your forebearer made. Um, Ms. Schwartz, I want to ask you, and I invite the other panelists to also weigh in on this, uh, your thoughts as to whether the Treaty of New Echota is still in force, and to explain whether you believe the Cherokee Nation is a successor uh, in interest uh, to the treaty or whether that's still an open question because obviously we have some some issues raised by others about that if i can briefly address the latter part of your question first um, the congressional research service does not take a position on whether um, the cherokee nation or other tribes are successors in interest to the uh, cherokee tribe that signed the treaty we are participating in this hearing uh, essentially on the understanding that the Cherokee Nation is a successor in interest. And there has been case law um, determining that the Cherokee Nation is a successor in interest to um, the historic Cherokee tribe, particularly in the context of the 1866 treaty, which did reaffirm the previous treaties, including the Treaty of New Echota. Um, but we do not take a position on whether other um, Cherokee tribes of today are also successors in interest at this Thank point. Thank you very much. It's very good. Uh, I'd invite Chief Hoskins and then uh, Professor Robertson to, to answer the same question. Well, Representatives, I do have an opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> I suspected you might. And I think plainly the historic record and the law uh, demonstrates that the Cherokee Nation, of which I've got the honor of being the elected principal chief today, is the Cherokee Nation, the same Cherokee Nation that is party to every treaty with this country since its founding and that predated this country. Uh, I have great respect for the two other uh, Cherokee bands that have been mentioned, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in North Carolina and the United Katua Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma. Uh, 
the issue with the Eastern Ban was, uh, was uh, disposed of by the United States Supreme Court uh, in a decision in which they determined that they were not the successor in interest. That question's been asked and answered. The United Ketua Band, the Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma, was authorized by this Congress in 1946 and recognized in 1950, uh, more than a century after the Treaty of 1835, certainly, and well after the last treaty that this nation, the Cherokee Nation, signed with this country in 1866. Uh, the Cherokee Nation, of which I have the honor of being the chief, is the same Cherokee Nation that signed those treaties. Uh, Professor Robertson? Yeah, I'm not sure I have much to add to what's been said by my co-panelists. Uh, I do understand that the Interior Department is looking into the um, some of the questions that you raised, Congressman Cole, uh, and I believe that process is ongoing, so it may be that there are answers coming from Interior. Okay. Uh, Professor Robertson, let me ask you this question. Um, both the Constitution and Supreme Court precedent have highlighted the equality principle, the idea that one person's vote is equal to another person. With the potential of appointing a delegate who would already have congressional representation, would you have any concerns about the constitutionality of the delegate? And I would invite others to respond as well. Yeah, I, I think the, the argument that I, that I, that I find persuasive uh, is, is the distinction between a, that's been raised in some of the materials presented is the distinction between a member slash representative and a delegate. Uh, the power of delegates is, well, there may be some practical uh, uh, advantages uh, to our represented constituency to having a delegate in, in terms of opportunities on committees. The, the denial of the power to vote for final passage of legislation, I think, is a severe limitation. And I think, uh, I think the Constitution uses the phrases uh, member and representative uh, deliberately uh, to, to, you know, to assure, and, and the constitutional law cases relate to those positions um, because they have a final say over the laws that, uh, that, that govern, govern the land. Uh, and there, I think the equal, equal protection concern is, is most severe. So, um, it, you know, without having dived into the issue in depth, um, my, my, my initial thought is that uh, that, that distinction is, is material uh, and so I, I don't know that I would have any particular concerns. Okay, uh, I'll turn to you, Ms. Schwartz, and then Chief Hoskins, if I'd, I'd love to get your opinion as well. So the uh, instruction that we have from the courts um, is not directly applicable to this case. Uh, we do have determinations about the constitutionality of the current delegates, the territorial delegates, but there is a distinction in that none of the territorial delegates represent um, citizens or residents who already have representation in the House. So the particular situation that we're facing here is not one that the courts have weighed in on. Um, that said, uh, simply because something has not been done before does not necessarily mean that it cannot be done. Uh, it's simply a consideration that this body should take into account when it is making its decisions. Uh, there is the possibility that uh, someone could try to raise an equal protection claim. It's not clear whether the courts would hear that claim or indeed how they would rule on it if it were raised. Thank you. Chief Hoskins? Well, I would just reiterate an earlier statement that I made that the uh, the, the power, the voice of the representatives of this body is on final passage. The delegate would not possess that right and so would not be exercising that uh, final uh, authority on the part of a member of Congress. And let's remember, the United States crafted this provision and said that the Cherokee Nation shall have a delegate. That's the Cherokee Nation's governmental interest. The Cherokee Nation has read that and, and that informed our decision as Cherokee people to fashion our Constitution to appoint the delegate to represent the Cherokee Nation's government. I think that uh, the United States would uh, need to uh, err on the side of making this uh, provision uh, effective uh, rather than, uh, uh, I don't want to suggest finding a way to make it ineffective, but I would say uh, let's find a way to make it effective just looking at the plain terms of the treaty. The Cherokee Nation shall have this right. Okay. Let me ask one final question, I'll, and I'll address it initially to you, uh, Dr. Robertson, but I also would then open it up uh, to the panel. And, uh, you know, in this body, uh, we all have our 
differences, but uh, we're generally pretty united on we're not very fond of the United States Senate. Uh, you know, and, and that <laughs> seems to be a bipartisan consensus on that, and it really doesn't matter who happens to be in control at a given moment. Uh, we, we have our problems with the Senate. So we have a treaty uh, that was obviously, uh, you know, concluded by representatives of the President of the United States, uh, approved by the Senate of the United States, but affects the membership of the House of Representatives. And uh, you know, we obviously were not party to that decision. Um, so to proceed, uh, does the House expressly have to act, number one? Uh, and number two, or, or could you go to a court, for instance, and, and okay, this is a treaty right and assert it, but does the House, number one, have to act? And again, uh, uh, and we've addressed this a little bit, but I want to be very clear about it. Uh, your opinions uh, collectively between the virtue, again, of a statute and a resolution, depending on how we act. And I think you've all addressed this one way or the other, but I think it'd be very helpful to have it very specific. So if I can start, Professor Robertson, with you. Sure. Well, I think on the latter question, you know, the path of least resistance, especially if it comported with um, emotional predispositions, um, might be the best way to go, which is to say, um, to heck with the Senate. Let's uh, let's just do this ourselves because we decide that it's the right thing to do to follow through with uh, obligations that the United States uh, undertook uh, to follow through with um, ages ago. Uh, uh, and um, by the way, I might add, my mother was a Senate staffer during the whole of my childhood, so I understand institutional inter inter uh, we all house have rivalry. To be ashamed Very of well. Our past. <laughs> um, so the uh, uh, your your first question. I'm sorry. Can you remind me? It ha uh, it was whether you have basically to act or, or whether this could this right be enforced uh, in a court without action by the house. In other words, does this require action by the house, be it resolution or statute? And then second, the merits of yeah. either one of those approaches. Yeah, I, th I think uh, as a, my, my guess is uh, I just taught the political question doctrine cases last week, and my, my, my gut is that this is precisely the sort of question that a federal court would decide it did not want to mess with. Um, and so my guess is that this would likely be something that the courts wouldn't, wouldn't want to deal with, although theoretically, I, I imagine they, they would have jurisdiction and, and could. Um, so that's just sort of my guess based on having done this stuff for a long time. Um, as to um, as to the the merits uh, again of a of a statute or uh, the house acting unilaterally, I, I guess I'd repeat what I said earlier. I, I don't think there's any requirement for a statute. Uh, I think that uh, under the terms of the treaty and just the way that courts have dealt with Indian treaties forever, I think this is something you could do on your own. Uh, I think that the 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 objective disadvantage is again the one that's been alluded to earlier, which is that it it uh, would, it would be a terminal um, uh, right in the sense of a renewable right. Um, so, but that's a cost that would be paid uh, by the Cherokee Nation, and it, it sounds as though they're more than willing to pay it. And so uh, it just seems to me, uh, again, circling back to the beginning, my answer uh, that, you know, it would be easier for you guys to do this on your own. Uh, if you believe that it's the right thing to do, and I believe it's the right thing to do, then I'd say go ahead and do it. And then you know, see how it works out, see if there are challenges. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that there would be challenges. Uh, I agree with CRS that uh, that courts would find uh, justiciable or that they wanted to involve themselves with. Uh, and then in two years, uh, you know, see where everybody was and, and renew it, or maybe at that time, uh, pursue uh, pursue a statute. Okay, Ms. Ward. Thank you. So to the first part of your question, does the House have to act? I think the best answer is yes. I think it would raise serious constitutional questions if the Senate and the President acting through a treaty could bind the House to take an action that so uh, inherently affected the internal workings of the House. Uh, that would be um, unprecedented. It would be very different from uh, any other uh, operation of, of treaties that I'm aware of. Um, to the second part, could this be enforced in court if the House did not act? I again think the best answer is no. Um, 
And again, we don't have case law directly on this, so uh, the answer is not certain. But uh, there's, there's two things that I think are problematic there. First, it's really unclear who would have the ability to bring that suit to try to enforce it and whether they would have standing. Um, secondly, as my co-panelist alluded to, it may present a political question that the courts would not want to engage with um, under sort of principles of comity. And thirdly, I think if they did address it, that the separation of powers um, principles would really come into play, that they would be unlikely to order the House to do something that, again, so intricately affects the internal workings of the House uh, on the authority of something that the House had no say in. Thank you very much. Chief Hoskins? Well, Congressman, as to the question of, of the courts, uh, I'll, I'll probably uh, uh, think a bit more on the answer uh, before giving uh, this body a final one. Uh, in part because I'm going to think about what the, my fellow panelists have said, uh, in part because the Cherokee Nation has spent quite a bit of time across the street in a lot of cases lately, and maybe we've had our full of the judiciary. But, uh, <laughs> but in any case, I think that, uh, I think that, the, that this body, uh, as to the second question, this body absolutely could take action, should take action, and I think that uh, from the perspective of the Cherokee Nation, and I don't mean to, to be overly dramatic, but uh, we have waited two centuries. We believe the Senate has acted. We believe the President has acted. And now we think the House acting, even though it is not a durable instrument, uh, that a resolution uh, should pass this body. And I think it would send a powerful message uh, to the country, to the United States, to keep its promise in that fashion. Thank you very much. Thank uh, all of you again for appearing. And uh, again, Mr. Chairman, thank you oh, very, very much for holding this oh, hearing. Right. Very, very appreciative. Yield back. Yeah. And, and, and I just want to be clear, I mean, we, act, we actually do both, right? I mean, you, we could actually pass a, a, a resolution uh, to seat a delegate, and at the same time, if we wanted to, work on a, a, a more durable statute, uh, which will take a lot more time. Um, I mean, you, so there's nothing that says you can't do both, right? Uh, correct. Right. I'm not aware of any prohibition okay. on okay. doing right. both. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Torres. Um, thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member. I think um, a lot of my questions um, were proposed by, by both of you. Um, I do want to um, go back to Ms. Schwartz. You've, um, you started to quote a bit of Article 7. Are you able to read the entire Article 7 to us here today? Yes, I am. Great. So I don't have to read this little tiny writing on my iPad. <laughs> Article 7. The Cherokee Nation, having already made great progress in civilization and deeming it important that every proper and laudable inducement should be offered to their people to improve their condition, as well as to guard and secure in the most effectual manner the rights guaranteed to them in this treaty, and with a view to illustrate the liberal and enlarged policy of the government of the United States toward the Indians in their removal beyond the territorial limits of the states, it is stipulated that they shall be entitled to a delegate in the House of Representatives of the United States whenever Congress shall make provision for the same. Um, provision. When I look up the word provision, it's true meaning. It's preparation. It does not say by Congress passing a law. It simply says provision. We need, in order for you to be a member of Congress, a delegate, or a commissioner, you need to have your name on a ledger. You need to have an office. You need to have a budget. You need to have staff. When I read through Article 7, and specifically speaks to improving conditions for the Cherokee Nation, and that Congress is left with its duty to provide room for another representative in the People's House. It does not say that Congress should pass a resolution. There were 20 signers, 10 witnesses, this treaty 
was very clear in defining the word to improve conditions and preparation, in my opinion. I'm not an attorney, nor do I pretend to be today. Um, but I do believe that the preparation that we were talking, that they were talking about here in the treaty was not for the vote of Congress because the treaty had already been agreed in consent with the Senate. It's unfortunate that the Senate did not agree to have a delegate in their house, but this is the people's house. Um, so, you know, I think that that is where we need to look at how do we honor that. Um, Chief Hoskin, has the federal government um, improved conditions of the Cherokee Nation? Has the federal government, aside from, from Article 7, upheld its duty to provide and protect. Thank you, Congresswoman. If I look at the last two centuries, I would say the balance is in favor of the United States having diminished the Cherokee Nation, suppressed the Cherokee Nation, dispossessed us from things that are precious, and put us on the receiving end of uh, things that I think this country uh, now regrets. If you look uh, more recently in history, our relationship with the United States is much improved. I mentioned earlier the period of the 1970s to the present. That was a change in federal Indian policy that restored the uh, civic institutions of the Cherokee Nation and other tribes, put us on a path that, frankly, we would be on before European contact, which is self-determination, charting our own course. And so in that respect, in the last 40, 50 years, we have been on a trajectory of improvement uh, the United States has a great deal of work to do. I mean, when it comes down to it, the next time the United States fulfills a solid promise to the Cherokee Nation will be the first time it's done it. Uh, the next time, and with all due respect to the Congress, the next time the Congress fulfills its trust obligations with respect to funding and other types of resources will be the first time that it's done it. So there is more work to do. In the balance of two centuries, the United States is far behind improving conditions. However, we are on a path of progress. What an amazing mark of progress would it be to fulfill a two-century-old treaty that up to this point, and I want to stress this to the committee, up to this point, if you ask a charity, what, Cherokee, what does the Treaty of Nua Chota mean to you? It means pain, indignity, and injustice. We can turn that into justice and a measure of restoration for the Cherokee people and a measure of progress. In looking at whether the government, the federal government, has provided even basic needs, Water. Well, if you look across Indian country, there's still a great deal of deficits. It's true in the Cherokee Nation. I think about in this role uh, what Kim Teehee may do in this Congress as a champion for all of Indian country. And we know that there's parts of Indian country where the circumstances are completely desolate when it comes to basic infrastructure. There are parts of Cherokee Nation where it's lacking. Uh, and I think the United States can do a l great deal more to close that gap. Having a voice in this Congress will help that but there is more work to do. Because and I think that is what is key here, is having a voice in this Congress. Representation truly does matter, uh, in my opinion. Um, as, I, as I close, I haven't had an opportunity to um, speak with you before today to thank you um, about the work that you have done in my district um, to ensure that the, the shelter, the migrant shelter for children, tender age children, um, was run by you. Um, you received the federal contract on that. Um, and while my weekly visits uh, might have not been as welcome to some, to the Cherokee Nation, they were very welcome. Holding the Cherokee Nation accountable for um, uh, keeping to the contract, the specific contract of what was called out to protect um, these children, I was there every week to make sure that you were doing that. And you were there every week at the table ensuring that my questions were answered. Um, so when we look at um, other shelters and 
we look at the abuses from um, forcing children to um, take narcotics. Um, you can call them medication. They're, I call them drugs. Um, sexual violence against tender age children. Physical violence against um, children. None of that happened under your watch and my watch because we were both diligent. So thank you for... Um, you know, meeting the needs of that contract. And I hope that someday the federal government will also meet you eye to eye on this treaty. And I yield back. Dr. Burgess. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, I, I, I will also stipulate that uh, Frank Member Cole asked a great number of the questions that, uh, that I was contemplating, but Thank, thank you all for being here today. And, and Chief, can I just ask you, because it is a, a deficit in my historical knowledge, you, you keep referring to an 1866 re, what was it a reformatting or a re-signing of, of, of the treaty at that, at that time? Is that, is that correct? That's correct. If I could, 1866, of course, was coincided with the end of the American Civil War, of which the Cherokee Nation figures in, uh, in terms of splitting our nation and our various alignments uh, with uh, the Confederacy and with the Union. And it's a, it is itself an interesting history and an important history. In the post-Civil War era, there were a series of treaties that the United States came to the tribes at that era and renegotiated, and so there were changes. The key provision, and I'm glad you brought this, is that in the 1866 treaty, the framers were careful to say that any provision in a prior Cherokee Nation treaty not inconsistent with the new terms were carried forward. So in that respect, Article 7 of 1835 was explicitly carried forward as part of that clause. So it would have been <coughs> reaffirmed as yes, a result sir. of the 1866 treaty. And, uh, Ms. Schwartz, thank you for reading Article 7 for us. Uh, it is... As, as, as I listened to you you reading that, it in my mind's eye, it was describing a people that were relocated outside of the then existing United States to an area that was, in fact, a territory and not a state. Does that have any implication for what we're discussing today now that statehood, whether we'd agreed with it or not, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> kidding because Texas, Oklahoma has a certain rivalry. But after statehood was conferred upon Oklahoma, did that, does that change the equation now that Oklahoma is a state? Uh, it's certainly something that this body can take into consideration when it is deciding its interpretation of the treaty language. Um, the words immediately preceding the delegate provision do say um, in their removal beyond the territorial limits of the states. So certainly at the time the treaty was signed, the Cherokee did not have other representation in Congress because the area to which they were removed was not a state. Um, however, it does then say it is stipulated that they shall be entitled to a delegate in the House of Representatives uh, whenever Congress shall make provision for the same. And that provision is not explicitly contingent on the... Uh, territory remaining not a state, and because, uh, at least in courts, one of the canons of construction is that treaties are not abrogated by implication, um, meaning that a court is probably unlikely to find that the delegate provision was implicitly abrogated by statehood, because Congress, when they made Oklahoma a state, did not say, and now the delegate provision of the Treaty of New Echota is abrogated. Well, let me just ask you a question then. Say, for example, the Dakota Territory, when statehood uh, was achieved by North and South Dakota, presumably they had territorial representatives, did, or did they have territorial representatives in the House of Representatives at that time? going to refer to uh, my chart for Dakota. There was a territorial representative established in 1861. So when statehood was achieved, it was no longer necessary to have the territorial representative. Is that, would that be a correct understanding of what 
Correct. So the Statehood Act or the Enabling Act itself generally uh, took care of arranging those procedural matters. And then when Oklahoma became a member of the United States, and we are grateful that you became a member of the United States, even though you raid our high school football ranks for your football team. Uh, but seriously, what... I'll stipulate, usually this year accepted, our Texas players are better than your Texas players. <laughs> Is, was, do, does this figure into the discussion at all is, is the only question I'm asking because just like Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole, and we all get questions about this, and I just want to be sure that we have our facts correct when we present this information on the floor of the House. So because there was not a Cherokee delegate in the House at the time of Oklahoma statehood, the legislation uh, enabling Oklahoma statehood did not mention a Cherokee delegate. So, so it was neither acknowledged as a continuing promise okay. nor eliminated. Okay, so it was silent on the, on the fact. Okay, well, then I'll just ask the same question you've probably been asked now three or four different times. And um, if you detect a theme of, of concern about the other body here in the Capitol, I mean, it's... It, <laughs> It's, it's earned, uh, because we've all had experience, but the concept of the Senate requiring an action of the House is, seems a little bit strange to some of us, recognizing that in the separation of powers, they can't raise taxes, we can't do treaties, but then they can rename House-passed bills and insert entire new provisions in them that are revenue raisers. So the Senate effectively gets around the fact that the House is the, the site of the uh, origin of all revenue bills. But we never into, enter into treaties on the House side. So this is something that, from an institutional perspective, is I think we need to address the ability of the Senate to require us to do something as a result of one of the treaties that the Senate has entered into. So I think that's why my answer to the question of whether this could be enforced in court absent any action by the House is likely not. I think a court would be very reluctant to find that the Senate and the President could essentially bind the House yeah. to, to do something. Well, well, Chief, let me just ask you, has, has it ever been tried? Has, it ever, has, the, has the process ever gone through the courts to try to enforce the Senate's provision? On the House? The, an the answer is no. The first act of asserting this right was when I took the United States up on its offer and appointed Kim Teehee and coming here today. Okay. Well, thank you all for, uh, for your input this morning. It's been, uh, it's been very educational. I've learned a number of things. It's, uh, what can I say? I mean, it's obviously a, an honor to serve with uh, Ranking Member Cole. He's, uh, he and I came into Congress at the same time. I've learned a great deal from his wisdom here on the on the committee, and obviously we'll continue to do so. But thank you all for your participation this morning. Thank I'll you. Yield back, Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Mr. Raskin. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I need to start um, by asking unanimous consent to submit uh, a statement for the record. Uh, last year, Secretary Holland approved a new constitution for the Cherokee Nation, uh, which explicitly ensures the protection of the political rights of all Cherokee citizens, including the tribe's black members. These individuals are descendants of the Cherokee freedmen who were enslaved by the tribe before the Civil War and were um, emancipated afterwards. Echoing Secretary Holland, I want to applaud the Cherokee Nation for its decision to honor uh, its moral and legal obligations to the freedmen and their descendants. It's a crucial step towards racial equality, justice, and reconcilia reconciliation, and it's worthy of our appreciation and our uh, emulation. Mr. Chairman, therefore, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a statement from Mr. Demario Solomon Simmons of Tulsa, Oklahoma, which commends the Cherokee Nation for taking this step and expresses hope that it will herald a new era of openness and inclusivity um, in the nation. Without objection. Thank you. Um, but Mr. Chairman, um, uh, it, it's an extraordinary uh, moment that uh, you and Mr. Cole have uh, allowed us to have here. Um, and uh, none of us um, should be unaware of the history-making nature of this proceeding. Um, I wanted to start by asking whether uh, Delegate Teehee is actually present. It, it, Delegate Teehee is here. Good. Well, I want to welcome Delegate Teehee. 
um, at least on behalf of the, the good people of Maryland's uh, 8th Congressional District, and it's uh, great to see you here uh, the, representing the Cherokee Nation. Um, and um, I, I want to ask a few questions, which I think will lead up to my basic point, but I want to make sure I believe in my basic point, so that's why I want to ask some questions. But based on what I've heard, I think there's a very e one easy question and one hard question before us. The easy question is, um, do we have a, uh, a legal and, I would say, a moral obligation to seat uh, Ms. Teehee? Uh, and the answer to that seems to me uh, clearly to be yes. Uh, this is just a matter of reading uh, the, the 1835 Treaty of New Echota um, and then uh, establishing its meaning and then acting upon it. That doesn't strike me as difficult at all, but I do want to ask a few more questions related to it. The difficult question is, what does it mean to be a delegate from... Uh, a nation to the House of Representatives, which we've never done before, because the delegates we have are either from territories, American Samoa, Guam, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, or they are from the District of Columbia, which inhabits still a different uh, sub-constitutional uh, jurisdictional plane. Um, and so this would be new for us, um, and it's not a foreign nation that... Um, we would be seating uh, a delegate for. It's a domestic nation. Um, and so I think that that's the question we need to look at. But l let me just quickly try to go through some questions to make sure that uh, I've got confidence in these conclusions. Um, to begin with, um, uh, have there been delegates elected before by the Cherokee Nation, or is Delegate Teehee the first one? Delegate Teehee is the first one. If you look in the historic record, there may be references to a delegation going to Washington, D.C., but they were not elected in the formal sense, and they were not done pursuant to this treaty. And do you have within your records um, any correspondence historically between the tribe and the House of Representatives or Congress asking to be seated before? I'm not aware of any contemporaneous documents. On okay, that. fair enough. So we, there's no adverse authority that the Congress said no or the House said no. Um, okay, that's out there. Um, the people have talked about the language in Section 7 of the treaty about whenever Congress shall make provision for the same. Of course, um, Congress is defined in our Constitution under Article 1, which says that each House shall define the rules of its own proceedings, and we also decide upon our own members, um, and we certainly decide on our own delegates. Um, uh, there, it's true that there have been statutes uh, passed before, but they are seated uh, by the House, and this one comes to us in a somewhat different posture because it comes by virtue of treaty. And of course, the Supremacy Clause of the Constitution says that treaties uh, exist on the exact same level as federal statutes do. So it's a binding law upon us. A treaty is binding upon us just like any other federal law would be. Um, so the, right now, Delegate Teehee, came to her official position by virtue of an appointment. Is that right? That's correct. And is that under uh, some bylaw that you've written? That's or? pursuant to the Constitution of the Cherokee Nation, which was ratified by the Cherokee people. The new Constitution. It, correct. That, the, the, Constitution yeah, the, the new Constitution includes that language, yes. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, um, all right, so all of this would be self-executing. I guess my question is, um, what we would have to figure out only is rival claims to being the successor to the Cherokee Nation that entered into the 1835 treaty. And I haven't had a chance to scrutinize the, the letters like from the United Kituwa Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma. I don't know, I, how many other claimed rivals are there? Is it just that one? Or Congressman? From what I heard earlier from the chairman, there were letters received from two uh, bands of Cherokees, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and the United Katua Bands, and I, I addressed earlier that uh, those claims to successorship, in my opinion, don't uh, withstand any scrutiny. All right, and so we, we, I, I do think, Mr. Chairman, that's something we would have to figure out. Um, you know, when we say, well, th when the court says that's a political question, that means we have to figure it out. It is up to us. Our decision and judgment on that would be binding 
Um, it certainly seems from everything I've seen that you guys are the logical successor, but obviously we would have to do our due diligence on that before we you know, rendered um, a final decision on it. Um, all right, so then I, I want to shift to this other question of what actually it would mean to send a delegate here. Um, my understanding of the delegate positions falls into a couple of different categories. If you look at the Northwest Ordinance and the delegate positions that were created then, Jefferson basically had the idea that the delegates would be representing territories that are essentially states in waiting or states in training, states uh, in tutelage to become states, right? And so they would send delegates and those representatives would learn more about the federal government and also take back information from the federal government to the territories. Um, that's obviously not applicable because you're not on the pathway to being admitted as a state and that's not part of the understanding, as, at least as I get it. Um, the other, of course, is the, the District of Columbia delegate. Um, Washington, D.C. has itself petitioned for statehood, but that's for the non-federal areas. That's for the residential areas, which they want to be ceded to a new state. The uh, existing capital uh, federal district would still be directly under uh, Congress. I don't know whether or not there would still be a non-voting delegate there, but that's also seen as like a permanent part of the country. But so uh, you would arrive as something between a delegate and like an ambassador, right? And I just wonder, that will have implications in terms of uh, how we seat you and what you do or what Delegate Teehee would do once she gets here. Um, she obviously can't vote on final passage. The Supreme Court and the D.C. Circuit Court have been clear about that even with respect to these delegates in a case called Michael versus Anderson, I think it was in 1994, they said these people cannot vote on final passage, um, even though it's okay for them to vote in committee because that you know, can be reversed on the floor. So it wouldn't be that. Um, we would wanna make sure presumably that there be every equal dignity and ceremony attendant to the office that the other delegates get. I guess the big question is serving on committee and then there is that, that question of the, is there a kind of double representation that, uh, you know, the Cherokee Nation is obviously all over the country. How many states are included? All 50 states. All 50 states, okay. So, um, yeah, in, in that sense, I guess the, the members of your nation would be double represented if they had a representative on the committee from their district, and then they also had the Cherokee Nation representative there. I don't know how big a deal that is, uh, because presumably Delegate Teehee or her successors would be looking out for the interests of the nation as a nation. Is that understanding right? That's my understanding. That's how yeah. I read the treaty. That's how I understand her role. Yeah. So would there be only certain committees that you think she would want to serve on or you would want your delegate to serve on? Um, do you not want to serve on committees? Uh, and what is your thinking about that? This is my view of it, Congressman, is that the time, I think the framers of this treaty plainly uh, were concerned about the governmental interest of the Cherokee Nation being having a place in this body. If you look at what our governmental interests are today, they really cross every committee that you have. The Cherokee Nation today, here's the shorthand way I would describe our government. We do everything the United States does except maintain a standing army and print money. Sometimes I wish we printed money, but we don't print money. Uh, but we do a great deal of things. And so if you look at what we do in terms of a governmental interest, I think it spans the entire depth and breadth of this body. And so I would think that any committee assignment would be fair game. Perhaps there's some exceptions to that. Uh, but I think primarily if you focus on what our main day-to-day -day issues are, certainly natural resources, certainly our engagement with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and certainly uh, anything that touches upon sovereignty would be important. But again, health care, human services, yeah. uh, infrastructure, it's broad. Well, so, so I, I... The Rules Committee yeah. is a good committee. The Rules Committee is a great committee. <laughs> well, the, 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 Mr. Chairman, um, just on this point, I think that we should be um, creative in our thinking about it. There may be, you know, a, a certain committee that that the member could be a standing member of or would be, you know, like natural resources or interior, you know, something like that. Or we could also say, because it, uh, all of the work of the Congress affects the Cherokee Nation, perhaps the member could just wave on to any committee when there is a hearing of interest to 
her or to him. I don't know. I think we could think about it differently because I do think for us, we have to distinguish between the role of territorial and district delegates from the role of a delegate of a nation, even, even if it's a domestic nation. And um, in any event, I want to thank you for your patience. That should be a, a massive understatement, obviously. Um, but I don't think we should be very patient uh, in the final days of this Congress. Uh, and I, I think we should act with dispatch to make this happen. I think there are some final things we got to figure out, but we should move as quickly as possible. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Uh, most of my Actually, not most. All of my questions have already been asked and answered at this point. Uh, but I think it's a really fascinating discussion. I can't help but to think how different our history might have been had we brought the tribes more into the fold uh, from the very beginning. But uh, with that, I'm looking forward to having an offline discussion with my good friend from Maryland because I've got some questions. I was going to ask you to yield for a question, but I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> so, so I'll talk to you offline about some of my thoughts to see, to see your opinion. So. Um, thanks to everybody for testifying, and I yield back. Thank you. Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your testimony today, and thank you, Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole, for holding this hearing. It's uh, certainly not often we have such a unique uh, opportunity to really probe into history and um, a lot of really fundamental questions. Um, I, I guess one thing I was really struck by... Um, Chief Hoskins uh, quoting from John Ridge's letter and um, the, really made it explicit that the Cherokee agreement to the treaty um, was really, that the issue of the delegate was really central. And I was curious, and I would ask this of each of our witnesses, are there other key elements uh, from the contemporaneous, uh, the, the folks who negotiated the treaty that that you would point to as being particularly instructive as to what people intended with respect to the delegate? And I'd start with you, Chief Hoskins. Well, Representative, thank you for that. I, I, I wish I could be more responsive to your question. That was a very powerful passage mm -hmm. from John uh, Ridge, and uh, that entire history of how that treaty was negotiated is itself fascinating. Uh, if there's more to add to the record, we mm -hmm. will supplement. I'm not, though, prepared here to pr provide any further, but I do think okay. that dro drove the point home nicely. <laughs> okay. And Ms. Schwartz, is there anything, including you can point us to the particular parts of the CRS history if, or the CRS report, if that's easiest? Yeah, it's not um, directly contemporaneous with the New Echota Treaty, but in a later treaty that was negotiated actually with the Confederacy, there is a similar delegate provision that goes into a little bit more detail um, about the expectation that the delegate would have the same rights and privileges of other representatives in that body. Of course, that's not a treaty with the United States, and it was about um, uh, about 30 years after the Treaty of New Echota. But I do think that Congress could look to that for some assistance in understanding the New Echota Treaty provision in the way that the tribe likely would have understood it. Okay, thank you. And Professor Robertson, anything? Yeah, I'm not sure I can add much to that, except uh, in terms of, uh, I think your point is absolutely on the money. And I think uh, in terms of the importance, it's uh, maybe helpful to look back to the 1830 Dancing Rabbit Creek Treaty, uh, with which the Nochoda negotiators would, of course, have been uh, familiar. Uh, and I think the difference in language uh, must reflect their uh, intention that, that, this, that this right be um, more precisely articulated. Uh, and I think that's a reflection, must be, a, a, again, a reflection of the, uh, of the nation's uh, or the negotiating team's, uh, at any rate, commitment to, uh, to securing the delegate right. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Chief Ho Hoskin, um, I guess, can you just tell us a little bit about why now, why the push now, what is the importance um, to the Cherokee people of um, seating a delegate at this time, and, and what you think that can accomplish? Well, personally, I feel duty-bound to assert every single right of every single treaty we have, because I know that our ancestors paid a dear price for it, and I can't imagine leaving this office of principal chief without doing everything I can to hold the United States accountable for that as a measure of justice. Uh, 
council members are here behind me, and I don't want to speak for them, but they have echoed this in my conversations with them. The why now gets back to the question of why not uh, 100 or two centuries ago, and of course I went through the history. The Cherokee Nation, this is what I want Americans to understand. Yes, two centuries we had this right, but did we possess it in a real way? We didn't possess it in a real way when the government of the United States suppressed our institutions almost out of existence. We are now, uh, I, again, I'm thinking back to my grandfather. He would be awestruck that his grandson is in the Rules Committee of the House of Representatives asserting a treaty right that his ancestors uh, were at least around for and suffered for. And so I think why now, why not now? Okay. Thank you. I respond to my friend very quickly, just to make a point. This is not unusual. I mean, uh, we've had settlements with the United States of America and various Indian nations about the United States' failure to sustain its treaty rights decades after, you know, tribe after tribe have asserted. And historically, politically, for reasons that ought to be embarrassing to all of us, those were not kept at the time. But later, it was recognized, yeah, we did the wrong thing. Uh, you know, we've had litigation in Oklahoma involving Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws on water rights and riverbeds. And, yeah, we didn't do what we were supposed to do. You're not asking for this back, but here's the settlement or something. Or you are getting this back because we just did the wrong thing. So, uh, you know, I don't think you can guilt people for not doing something in a time period that was impossible to do but maintaining the right to do it when they had the opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, I think that's what we're wrestling with here. But uh, uh, again, I, I certainly understand uh, asserting rights after the fact, because they were there, but people just knew, okay, we're not gonna get that. You know, we're, we're, they agreed to it, but they're not gonna keep their word. But now, it is a different time. And, and the government of the United States, as, as my good friend the chief said, uh, in recent years has done a lot in various areas to correct mm -hmm. some of the inequities of the past. And I think of that in our own constitutional history. You know, all men are created pretty equal or pretty clear, uh, but when they wrote it in 1787, uh, didn't apply to women, didn't apply to black men, yellow men, red men. We figured out over time, hey, that's what we wrote. And that's, that's the implication. And I think that's what you're looking at here. But again, that's just my opinion. Thank, I thank my friend for allowing me to, to insert myself. Certainly. And really appreciate everyone's testimony on, on helping us figure out a path forward, because it certainly seems like we need to take that path. Thank you. Yield back. Well, thank you very much. Um, you know, um, let me ask the, I mean, the panel. I mean, um, I think everybody's asked their questions, but uh, let, me, let me go to uh, 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 Professor Robertson and, uh, and, and Ms. Schwartz and, and Chief, again, if there's any final things that you want to say for the record before I yield to Mr. Cole for his closing remarks, then I'll make a final statement as well. So, uh, Prof uh, Professor Robertson, any, anything that you want to add uh, for this re for the record of the hearing? Yeah, yeah thank you, Congressman. I, I'd just like to add uh, maybe a little bit in what, by way of response to a couple questions that members of the committee asked a minute or so ago. Um, uh, including uh, this most recent uh, comment by um, Congressman Cole and to, to sort of reinforce the point that he made. I think it's important to remember that one avenue that was closed in pursuing this right to, to tribes in general, but to the Cherokee Nation in particular, was the judicial route. Uh, it's important to remember that the case that gave us the phrase domestic dependent nation was a jurisdictional case in which the Supreme Court said squarely to the Cherokee Nation, you can't bring federal lawsuits. Uh, and uh, that case gets dismissed, and then Georgia's imposition of its laws gets challenged by a non-Indian who's imprisoned, and there's sort of a way around it. But it's unclear to me how, how this claim would have been pursued um, had the Cherokee Nation chose to, uh, prior to the modern era when the federal government's been much more open to claims by Native tribes. Uh, in response uh, to a couple questions um, that Mr. Burgess raised, uh, one uh, having to do with uh, Senate imposition of obligations on the House of Representatives. Um, I think it's important to, to note that that was actually in the Native American law sphere commonplace prior to 1871. Uh, every time the Senate negotiated uh, or rather ratified a treaty that the executive had negotiated, uh, virtually without exception, there was some funding obligation 
uh, and the House would have to sit down and figure out where to find the money. This won't sound surprising to, to you all. Uh, but in 1871, in the Indian Appropriations Act, uh, Congress insisted on the inclusion of a provision saying we're not doing treaties anymore. From now on, we'll continue to negotiate with tribes, but we're going to call them statutes so that we can have a say in what the terms are. The Treaty of New Echota from 1835 falls squarely in the middle of the period when it was commonplace for obligations like this to be placed on the House uh, by the Senate. And I think it's, it's important to sort of have that historical context when figuring out uh, how to implement that right today and maybe put ourselves back into that early 19th century framework um, because, you know, the tribe shouldn't be penalized because the Congress operates differently today. Um, they should, it seems to me, be able to uh, benefit from whatever the status quo was at the time that the treaty was negotiated. The last point uh, I'll make has to do with uh, the, the question from Congressman Burgess about the representatives uh, and delegates from the from the Dakotas. Um, I think the, the point's a fair one, but there's a difference uh, when dealing with the Cherokee Nation and Oklahoma. When, uh, when North and South Dakota became states, they essentially replaced the territory. Uh, and so it, it made sense for uh, the position of delegate to terminate and for the position of representative to replace it. Uh, when Oklahoma became a state, that had no impact on the continuing existence of the tribes. Uh, they continued to exist as governments. They continued to function through the 20th century. And so uh, because it's a different situation, it seems to me there, that it's, it's, it, 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 makes, it really doesn't make sense to, to, uh, to, to look to a, an example like the, the transition of the Dakotas from territory to state to figure out uh, what the right answer is vis-a-vis -vis tribal, uh, the continuing access or right to a tribal delegate. Um, uh, and then I suppose one final thing I'll say is to echo something that many have said, which is to thank the committee uh, again for holding this hearing. I, I agree with everyone who said this is uh, enormously important historically. Uh, I, I might briefly make a nod to uh, the international community, which I'm sure is is watching closely uh, for whatever uh, you may make of that. Uh, most of you will know that the United Nations adopted uh, uh, in 2007 and the U.S. signed on in 2010 a Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, um, a move like this to uh, provide representation uh, to recognize a treaty right and to enforce a treaty right uh, from the 1830s um, would, I think, be something that people would pay attention to. In the U.S., as Congressman Colwell knows, in recent years, and as I think Chief Hoskin alluded to, has been a global leader in the recognition of indigenous rights, uh, despite some shortfalls and slipbacks. Uh, and I think that um, it, it would speak well uh, to uh, the integrity of the Congress to engage in this sort of bipartisan activity on behalf of indigenous peoples at a time in world history when this is a, this is a, an issue of, of which humanity is becoming increasingly aware. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Schwartz. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make just a couple of points. Um, First, with uh, your permission, I'd like to read into the record a portion of the uh, court case that my co-panelist recommended to this body, the Soci v. United States case of 1986. A treaty is primarily a compact between independent nations, and our Constitution declares this Constitution and the laws made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made shall be the supreme law of the land and no distinction is there made between a treaty with a foreign nation and with an Indian tribe. A treaty with an Indian tribe, therefore, is a law of the land, as an act of Congress is. And where such treaty prescribes a rule by which private rights can be determined, the court will resort to such a rule. Otherwise, the court must look to the legislation of Congress for the enforcement of its provisions. Uh, I think this stands for the proposition that in this instant, in, in this instance, uh, a court would be likely to look to Congress for the enforcement of this treaty provision. Um, although my co-panelist said that at the time this treaty was signed, it was commonplace for obligations like this to be placed on the House without its involvement in the treaty negotiations, uh, it is important to distinguish that this is an obligation that relates to the internal workings of the House 
um, that that sort of obligation was not commonplace and is the reason that this is uh, being considered really for the first time and we don't have much in the way of case law to guide us. So in the end, the decision uh, really rests with Congress uh, and with this body to interpret those treaty provisions. Thank you. Uh, Chief Hoskin, any? Well, first of all, Mr. Chairman Waddell, again, for holding this hearing, and to all the, the members, including the ranking member, my friend, uh, Congressman Cole. Uh, specifically, Congressman Cole mentioned earlier something very important uh, in the broad scheme, and specifically to Congressman Raskin's questions about successor and interest. The Arkansas Riverbed case, which I think you were referencing, is an example of Congress doing the right thing to resolve an issue. I would, though, use that to direct you to an opportunity to resolve the successor and interest issue. The Congress dealt with that in the preamble, the early part of that statute. It's a good resource to resolve this issue in the favor of the Cherokee Nation. More broadly, Mr. Chairman, members, uh, if we start from the idea that the United States always intended to keep this promise, that it always intended what it meant, then we have to get Kim Teehee seated. And I think I would think there's universal recognition of that. If that's the case, then it, and, and if we recognize that the, the treaty is the supreme law of the land, it carries the weight of law, then I think the Congress is duty bound to seat Kim Teehee. I know there's questions about the manner in which she's seated, uh, very good questions raised today, but I think the conclusion is inescapable. And I think that conclusion uh, can be reached in this calendar year, and it is my hope as Chief of the Cherokee Nation that we achieve that, and I appreciate it. Go ahead. Thank you. And uh, before I close, I want to yield to my friend, Mr. Cole, for any final comments. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And again, I want to thank you personally. Uh, this hearing would not have happened uh, without you making the decision for it to happen and uh, uh, certainly working with us on our side of the aisle. And I am extraordinarily grateful. And uh, uh, I think um, um, sometimes it's difficult to drag people into these issues because they are complex, and we didn't have to drag you in. You volunteered to step in all on your own. And uh, um, I think you set an example. I hope other committees of jurisdiction follow your lead. Uh, that's number one. I want to thank our witnesses. I thought this was exceptionally good testimony. Um, and as I think I, I remarked early, I, I hope all of you you know, spoke to Congress because the questions that were asked by everybody up here are the questions uh, that our members are asking. Uh, and they do it, it's, it's not a, I always say Native American issues aren't and never should be partisan issues. They are, in this case, it's an institutional issue, it's an issue of sovereignty, it's an issue of trust obligation, there's a lot of things here. And I think the questioning really reflected that today. Uh, I do think it was an historic hearing, and I don't know if you realized how historic it would be when, when you agreed to do it, but I'm glad you did, uh, because I think these are issues that we ought to grapple with. They are very tough issues in some ways about our past, uh, but uh, they're very important issues for us to deal with. For one, I tend to think uh, that this does require congressional act action of some sort. You know, I'm open to statute. I'm open to resolution. I think the Cherokees have expressed their willingness to let's just move down the road and see where we end up, and uh, but whatever. Um, you know, I'm often, uh, I, I wrestle with a lot of these issues in the course of my career here and um, seen a lot of uh, things, uh, mistakes we've made in the past, but, uh, I, and I appreciate this hearing because I think we've approached it. It's never too late to do the right thing. It's not as if something that happened 150 years, 170 years ago, can't be addressed and corrected now. Uh, and uh, sometimes that's the right things to do. Sometimes maybe circumstances have changed. And, and I, I don't question anybody's motives wherever they come down on this issue. There are some really complex things here. There's some things that deal with the nature of the institution itself. Uh, the election provision is a big one for a lot of House members. Nobody's ever stepped on our floor that hasn't been elected except, as the Chief pointed out, appointed territorial delegates who have. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things that's been very helpful is make it very clear uh, that we're talking about a delegate situation here. We're not talking about final passage. We're not talking about something that can't be overruled on the floor. We're talking about something we're all very accustomed to uh, in terms of having delegates. And we have delegates that represent both parties on both sides of the aisle. We have, all our caucuses are familiar with this and how we handle it. So uh, I, I just think this has been an extraordinarily helpful hearing in clarifying the issues. And most importantly, and I know this was one of your main aims, Mr. Chairman, 
uh, making sure that the Cherokee Nation had a forum where its claim could be presented and heard and evaluated in a thoughtful way. That would not have happened without you. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, others have had the opportunity to do it and have chosen not to. You seize the opportunity, and uh, I appreciate that very much. So I look forward to continuing and work with my friends. Uh, I, I was listening to my friend, Mr. Raskins, who I always learn something, but uh, when uh, uh, he asked, was uh, uh, Delegate uh, T here, I thought, she's been here a lot longer than you have, partner. Because <laughs> I worked with her when she was uh, uh, our colleague, late uh, Dale Kildee's uh, top staffer on Indian Affairs, uh, and uh, of course had the opportunity to work with her when she was Chief, uh, President Obama's uh, you know, advisor on Native American friends. And if anybody thinks uh, she is not qualified to be here, doesn't know a way around the buildings, uh, we could have her leading tours to the new freshmen that are coming up uh, and advise them on what committees they should, uh, they should be on. Uh, and it was a fascinating discussion about committees, but I tend to come down where Chief Hoskins is. Almost everyone, I sit on the Appropriations Committee, we have enormous impact on Indian country. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, I guess if you had to rule something out, you could say foreign affairs or whatever, but the reality is I wouldn't rule anything out. I think, you know, that, that's a decision uh, of, uh, you know, any, any delegate that comes here can sit on any committee. They just have to go through, uh, you know, the process. They might not get the committee assignments they want at first, but eventually you might. So, I mean, we all live in that world. Um, uh, but, again, uh, last, last point, again, the witnesses I thought were exceptional. Uh, and I appreciate the professionalism uh, and the very, very even-handed approach and the education that you provided to all of us on the dais and hopefully through us, through our uh, colleagues uh, and the rest of Congress. Uh, and so again, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for holding the hearing. Uh, I appreciate it, and I think you'll look back on it uh, at once your career is done, which I hope is no time soon, uh, <laughs> as uh, something you can be very proud of having done. And uh, appreciate it. You'll back to my friend, the chairman. Well, thank you. And I, um, I, I want to um, also pay my, uh, my friend, Mr. Cole, a compliment. Um, you know, uh, we've worked together for a long time on a lot of issues. Sometimes we're in agreement, sometimes we're not. But even when we're not in agreement, uh, you know, uh, the, the discussion up here uh, is uh, is actually, you know, the way it should be, uh, respectful of one another, and um, and he, on, when it comes to these issues, there's nobody who is more dedicated uh, uh, and more uh, more of an advocate than he is, and and so I, um, it, it really is a privilege and honor to serve with him. I have, he's a really good friend, and I appreciate. I want to echo what he said. I the, I want to thank the panelists. You were you were excellent, and. You know, we we sit we, we we do a lot of hearings. We sit through a lot of hearings. Some hearings are like not particularly useful um, because nobody ever answers the questions. You all answered the questions, and they were tough questions that we get asked. We were being asked before this hearing. I think you have you know set the record straight. Um, you know, and this is this is where I kind of come down on this. I I personally believe that delicate Tehe ought to be seated. I you know I mean if if I you know, I think this is the right thing to do. Uh, as I study this issue, um, you know, I believe it's the right thing to do. It's the moral thing to do. Um, and for a lot of the reasons, Chief, that you have highlighted in your testimony. Uh, and so we got to find a way to get this done. Um, and, um, you, you know, and there's some complications here. Um, Mr. Raskin raised some issues. I, we, you know, our colleagues have raised some issues. But they're not so complicated they can't be worked out. Right. I mean, this is uh, th this is stuff that we can we, we can work it out and to get to a point where everybody I think feels relatively uh, comfortable. Uh, and um, and so I think we have to figure out how fast we can move, and that depends on, quite frankly, a consensus of this body. Um, do we have the votes to do this? Um, you know, and and we're gonna have to, and we want to do this in a bipartisan way because this is not a this should, this, th th these issues should not be not be partisan, um, and so we have to figure this figure this out. We're going to have to reach out to some of the other committees of jurisdiction, to, you know, to get their input on some of this stuff. But I don't want that to be an excuse to like you know five years down the road we have another 
meeting and you're like, what what happened? I mean, th 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 this should this can and should be done as quickly as possible. I mean, that is my my view. Look, uh, you know, the history of this country is a history of broken of, of broken promise after broken promise to Native American communities. This cannot be another uh, broken promise. And so you have my word, and I, I'm, I'm sure I speak for my, my friend, Mr. Cole, uh, as well, uh, that we're going to continue to work with you and to figure out a way to get, you know, to the finish line here. Um, and, um, and I, you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen in our elections. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I may not be chair of this committee, um, you know, uh, next year, or, or, or maybe a miracle will happen and I will still be. Who knows? But if he is, you're in good hands. Um, but it, it shouldn't matter. I mean, I think we're, we're at the, 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 the tone of this hearing today was such that this, this, was, this, was, this is not a partisan issue at all. I should also add the delegates don't get to vote on speaker either. Uh, so that's the other thing, you know. Um, you know, so there's nobody should be. You might get fast for action if they will. Right, right. <laughs> well, we, well, but I, I guess my view at this point is that you know you could do a, you could pursue two avenues here. Um, one is you know a, a simple resolution to change uh, the rules to seat a delegate as, as soon as po possible, even though that's subject to renewal every two years. But at the same time, you can pursue a longer term uh, statute um, so that that no longer is the case. But whatever it is, I mean, we got to figure out a way to, to, to move this quickly. So I want to I thank all of our witnesses for being here today and for sharing your expertise. I want to uh, thank um, all the members of this committee who participated uh, in this productive conversation. Um, and, um, and I look forward to seeing what comes next. So without objection, the Rules Committee stands adjourned.